Chapter 15 of The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Catherine. The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1, by Charles Johnson. Chapter 15 of Captain John Phillips and His Crew. John Phillips was bred a carpenter, and sailing to Newfoundland in a West Country ship, was taken by Anstis in the Good Fortune Brigadine. The next day after he had left his consort and commodore, Captain Roberts, Phillips was soon reconciled to the life of a pirate, and being a brisk fellow, was appointed carpenter of the vessel, for at first his ambition reached no higher. There he remained, till they bloke up at Tobago, and was one of those who came home in a sloop that we have mentioned to be sunk in Bristol Channel. His stay was not long in England, for whilst he was paying his first visits to his friends in Devonshire, he heard of the misfortune of some of his companions, that is, of their being taken and committed to Bristol jail, and there being good reason for his apprehending danger from a wind that blew from the same quarter, he moved off immediately to Topsham, the nearest port, and there shipped himself with one Captain Wadham for a voyage to Newfoundland, and home again, which, by the way, Mr. Phillips never designed to perform, or to see England any more. When the ship came to Peter Harbour, in Newfoundland aforesaid, he ran away from her, and hired himself a splitter in the fishery for the season. But this was only till he could have an opportunity of prosecuting his intended rogueries, in order to which he combined with several others, in the same employ, to go off with one of the vessels that lay in the harbour, upon the piratical account. Accordingly, the time was fixed, viz. the 29th of August, 1723, at night. But whether remorse or fear prevented their coming together, I know not. But of sixteen men that were in the combination, five only kept the appointment. Notwithstanding which, Phillips was for pushing forward with that small number, assuring his companions that they should soon increase their company, and they agreeing, a vessel was seized on, and out of the harbour they sailed. The first thing they had now to do was to choose officers, draw up articles, and settle their little commonwealth, to prevent disputes and wranglings afterwards. So John Phillips was made captain, John Nutt, master or navigator of the vessel, James Sparks, gunner, Thomas Fern, carpenter, and William White was the only private man in the whole crew. When this was done, one of them read out the following articles, which we have taken verbatim, and all swore to him upon a hatchet for want of a Bible. The articles on board the Revenge. 1. Every man shall obey civil command. The captain shall have one full share and a half in all prizes. The master, carpenter, boatswain, and gunner, shall have one share and quarter. 2. If any man shall offer to run away, or keep any secret from the company, he shall be marooned with one bottle of powder, one bottle of water, one small arm, and shot. 3. If any man shall steal anything in the company, or game, to the value of a piece of eight, he shall be marooned or shot. 4. If at any time we should meet another marooner, that is, pirate, that man shall sign his articles without the consent of our company, shall suffer such punishment as the captain and company shall think fit. 5. That man shall strike another, whilst these articles are in force, shall receive Moses' law, that is, forty stripes liking one, on the bare back. 6. That man that shall snap his arms, or smoke tobacco in the hold, without a cap to his pipe, or carry a candle lighted without a lanthorn, shall suffer the same punishment as in the former article. 7. That man that shall not keep his arms clean, fit for an engagement, or neglect his business, shall be cut off from his share, and suffer such other punishment as the captain and the company shall think fit. 8. If any man shall lose a joint in time of an engagement, shall have 400 pieces of 8. If a limb, 800. 9. If at any time you meet with a prudent woman, that man that offers to meddle with her without her consent shall suffer present death. Thus prepared, this bold crew set out, 
and before they left the banks they made prize of several small fishing vessels, out of which they got a few hands, some French and some English, and then sailed for the West Indies. In one of those vessels they took out one John Rose Archer, who, having been a pirate under the famous Blackbeard, immediately preferred over other people's heads to be quartermaster to the company, which sudden promotion so disgusted some of the older standards, especially Fern the carpenter, that it occasioned some mischief to follow, as we shall shew by and by. The pirates came off Barbados the beginning of October, and cruised there, and among other islands, above three months, without speaking with a vessel, so that they were almost starved for want of provisions, being reduced to a pound of meat a day between ten. At length they fell in with a Martiniso man, of twelve guns and thirty-five hands, far superior in force, and what they would not have ventured on at another time. But hunger will break down stone walls. They were resolved to shew the Frenchmen their black flag, and if that would not do, they must seek out elsewhere. Accordingly, they boldly ran up alongside of the sloop, with their piratical colors flying, and told them, if they did not strike immediately, they would give them no quarters, which so intimidated the Frenchmen that they never fired a gun. This proved a seasonable supply. They took her provisions, and four of her men, and let her go. They took presently after a sloop belonging to New York, and a Virginia man, Huffam Master. Having now occasion to clean their vessel, Phillips proposed Tobago, where the company he formerly belonged to, under Anstis and Fenn, broke up. To introduce them to it, he told them when he left the island, there was left behind six or eight of their company that were not willing to go to England, with three negroes. Whereupon they sailed to the island, and after a careful search, found only one of the negroes, whose name was Pedro, who informed Captain Phillips that those that were left behind were taken by a man-of-war's crew and hanged at Antigoa, among whom was Fenn, their captain. They took Pedro on board, and then fell to business, careening their vessel, and just as they had finished their work, a man-of-war's boat came into the harbor, the ship being cruising to leeward of the island. It was easily guessed upon what errand she was sent, and therefore they lost no time, but, as soon as the boat went away, warped out, and plied to windward for security, but left the four Frenchmen they took out of the Martinico sloop behind. In a few days they took a snow with a few hands, and Fern, the carpenter, one William Phelps, Wood, and Taylor, went aboard to take possession of her. Fern, not forgetting the affront of having Archer preferred before him, resolved to go off with the prize, and brought the rest into the same measures. However, Phillips, the captain, keeping a good lookout, perceived their design, and gave them chase, who, coming up with the vessel, a skirmish ensued, wherein Wood was killed and Taylor wounded in his leg, upon which the other two surrendered. There was no surgeon aboard, and therefore it was advised, upon a learned consultation, that Philip's leg should be cut off. But who should perform the operation was the dispute. At length, the carpenter was appointed as the most proper man, upon which he fetched up the biggest saw, and taking the limb under his arm, fell to work, and separated it from the body of the patient, in as little time as he could have cut a deal board in two. After that, he heated his axe red-hot in the fire, and cauterized the wound but not with so much art as he performed the other part, for he so burnt his flesh distant from the place of amputation that it had like to have mortified. However, nature performed a cure at last, without any other assistance. From Tobago they stood away to the northward and took a Portuguese bound for Brazil, and two or three sloops from Jamaica, in one of which Fern the carpenter, endeavoring to go off, was killed by Phillips the captain, pursuant to their articles. Another had the same fate, some days after, for the like attempt. These severities made it dangerous for any to consult or project an escape, the terror of which made several sign their articles and set down quietly, waiting impatiently for redemption, which as yet they saw no great likelihood of, and, should they have been taken before such circumstances appeared in their actions or characters, as afterward happened, to denote their innocence, they might have lost their lives upon a trial at a court of admiralty, for pretty strong evidence is expected in their favor to balance that of being taken aboard a vessel which is proved to be an actual piracy, and they assisting therein. 
Thus was many an honest man's case made most desperate by the consummate villainy of a few hardened wretches who fear neither God nor devil, as this Phillips used often blasphemously to express himself. On the 25th of March, they took two ships from Virginia for London. John Phillips, the pirate captain's namesake, was master of one, and Captain Robert Mortimer, the other, a brisk young fellow, that deserved a better fate than he met with. Phillips the pirate stayed on board of Captain Mortimer's ship, while they transported the crew to the sloop, and the boat returning alongside, one of the pirates therein calls to Phillips, and tells him there was a mutiny aboard their vessel. Mortimer had two men in his ship, and the pirate captain had two, therefore thought it a good opportunity to recover his ship, and directly took up a handspike and struck Phillips over the head, giving him a dangerous wound but not knocking him down. He recovered and wounded Mortimer with his sword, and the two pirates that were aboard coming in to Captain Phillips' assistance, Captain Mortimer was presently cut to pieces, while his own two men stood by and did nothing. This was the first voyage that Mortimer had the command of a vessel, by whose death is a poor disconsolate widow made miserable, more in regard of the mutual love and fidelity they lived in, than the loss of what would have been a handsome and comfortable provision for themselves and children, which, I think, now ought to be made up by the public, since twas in the public service he fell, for, had his attempt succeeded, in all probability he would not only have regained his own ship, but entirely subdued and destroyed the enemy, there being several, as it afterwards proved, that would have seconded such an enterprise whenever they found a beginning made. This affair ended without any other consequence than a strict search after a brother of Captain Mortimer, who was on board, in order to have him put likewise to death. But he had the good fortune to meet with a townsman among the crew, who hid him for four and twenty hours in a stay-sail, till the heat of their fury was over, and by that means happily missed of the fate designed him. Out of the other Virginia man before spoken of, they took one Edward Cheeseman, a carpenter, to supply the place of their late carpenter, Fern. He was a modest, sober young man, very averse to their unlawful practice, and a brave, gallant fellow. There was one John Fillmore of Ipswich, formerly taken by them, ordered to row cheesemen aboard of Mortimer's ship, which the pirates possessed themselves of, who, seeing with what reluctance and uneasiness cheesemen was brought away, told him— he would join with him, in some measures, to overthrow the piratical government, telling him withal their present condition, what difficulties Phillips had met with to make up his company, and how few voluntary pirates there were on board, and the like. But, however specious this seemed, Cheeseman, out of prudence, rejected his offers of assistance, till he saw some proofs of his sincerity, which after a few days he was convinced of, and then they often consulted. But as the old pirates were always jealous of the newcomers, and consequently observant of their behavior, this was done with the utmost caution, chiefly when they were lying down together as though asleep, and, at other times, when they were playing at cards, both which they feigned often to do for that purpose. The pirates went on all the while, plundering and robbing several ships and vessels, bending their course towards Newfoundland, where they designed to raise more men, and do all the mischief they could on the banks and in the harbors. Newfoundland is an island on the north continent of America, contained between the 46th and 538th of north latitude, discovered first by St. Sebastian Cabot, A.D. 1497, but never settled till the year 1610, when Mr. Guy of Bristol revived the affair, and obtained a patent, and himself to be governor. The island is deserted by the natives and neglected by us, being desolate and woody, and the coast and harbor only held for the conveniency of the cod fishery, for which alone they were settled. The bays and harbors about it are very numerous and convenient, and, being deeply indented, makes it easy for any intelligence to pass from one harbor to another over land, especially the principal. St. John's and Placentia, when the appearance of an enemy makes them apprehend danger. They are able to cure and export about 100,000 quintals, 100 weight each, of fish annually, which returns to England in money or the necessary commodities of Portugal, Spain, and Italy. As it therefore expends abundance of rum, 
molasses, and sugar, the product of our West India colonies, and employs a number of fishermen from home every season, by whose industry and labor only this fish is purchased. It may very well be reckoned an advantageous branch of trade. But the present design of this digression being not to give an exact description of the country or fishery, but rather how it accidentally contributes to raise or support the pirates already raised, I shall observe. First, that our West Country fishing ships, these from Topsham, Barnstable, and Bristol, who chiefly attend the fishing seasons, transport over a considerable number of poor fellows every summer, whom they engage at low wages, and are, by their terms, to pay for passage back to England. When the Newfoundland ships left that country towards winter, in the year 1720, these passengers mustered eleven hundred, who, during the season of business, the hardness of their labor and chillness of the nights pinching them very much, are mostly fond of drinking blackstrap, a strong liquor used there, and made from rum, molasses, and chowder beer. By this the majority of them outrun the constable, and then are necessitated to come under hard articles of servitude for their maintenance in the winter, no ordinary charge indeed. When the barrenness of the country is considered, and the stock of provision laid in, happen to fall short, in proportion to the computation made of the people remaining there the winter, which are generally about seventeen or eighteen hundred, the masters residing there think advantages taken on their necessities, no more than a just and lawful gain, and either bind such for the next summer's service, or sell their provisions out to them at extravagant rates. Bread, from fifteen shillings to fifty, immediately at the departing of the ships, and so of other sorts of food in proportion. Wherefore, not being able to subsist themselves, or in any likely way of clearing the reckoning to the masters, they sometimes run away with shallops and boats, and begin on piratical exploits, as Phillips and his companions, whom we are now treating of, had done. And secondly, which is more opportunely for them, they are visited every summer, almost, by some set of pirates or other, already raised, who call here for the same purpose, if young beginners, and to lay in a store of water and provisions, which they find imported, much or little, by all the ships that use the trade. Towards this country Phillips was making his way, and took on the voyage, besides those above mentioned, one Salter, in a sloop off the Isle of Sables, which vessel they made use of themselves, and gave back Mortimer's ship to the mate and crew. That same day, viz. the 4th of April, took a schooner, one Chadwell, master, which they scuttled, in order to sink. But Captain Phillips, understanding that she belonged to Mr. Miners at Newfoundland, with whose vessel they first went off a pirating, a qualm of conscience came athwart his stomach, and he said to his companions, We have done him injury enough already, so ordered the vessel immediately to be repaired, and returned her to the master. That afternoon they chased another vessel, and at night came up with her, the master of which was a saint of New England, named Dependence Ellery, who, taking Phillips for a pirate, he told him was the reason that he gave him the trouble of chasing so long, which, being resented by these men of honor, they made poor Dependence dance about the deck till he was weary. Within few days several other vessels had the same misfortune. The master's names were as follows. Joshua Elwell, Samuel Elwell, Mr. Combs, Mr. Lansley, James Babston, Edward Freeman, Mr. Start, Obadiah Beale, Eric Erickson, and Benjamin Wheeler. The 14th of April they took a sloop belonging to Cape Anne, Andrew Herodine, master. They looked upon this vessel more fit for their purpose, and so came aboard, keeping only the master of her prisoner, and sending Herodine's crew away in Salter's vessel, which they till this time detained. To this Herodine, Cheeseman the carpenter broke his mind, and brought him into the Confederacy to destroy the crew, which was put in execution four days afterwards. Herodine and the rest were for doing the business in the night, as believing they might be more opportunely surprised, for Newt, the master, being a fellow of great strength, and no less courage, it was thought dangerous to attack him without firearms. However, Cheeseman was resolute to have it performed by daylight, as the least liable to confusion, and as to the master, he offered to lay hands on him first. Upon this, twas concluded, twelve at noon was the appointed time. 
In order for the business, Cheeseman leaves his working tools on the deck, as though he had been going to use them, and walked aft. But, perceiving some signs of timidity in Herodine, he comes back, fetches his brandy bottle, and gives him and the rest a dram. Then drank to Burl, the boatswain, and the master, to their next merry meeting, and up he puts the bottle. Then he takes a turn with Nut, asking what he thought of the weather, and such like. In the meanwhile, Filemore takes up the axe, and turns it round upon the point, as if at play. Then both he and Herodine wink at him, thereby letting him know they were ready. Upon which signal, he seizes Nut by the collar, with one hand between his legs, and tossed him over the side of the vessel. But he, holding by Cheeseman's sleeve, said, Lord, have mercy upon me. What are you going to do, Carpenter? He told him it was an unnecessary question. For, says he, Master, you are a dead man. So strikes him over the arm. Nut looses his hold, tumbles into the sea, and never spoke more. By this time the boatswain was dead, for as soon as Filemore saw the master lay hold of, he raised up the axe and divided his enemy's head in two. The noise brought the captain upon deck, whom Cheeseman saluted with the blow of a mallet, which broke his jawbone but did not knock him down. Herodine came in then with the carpenter's adze, but Sparks, the gunner, interposing between him and Captain Phillips. Cheeseman trips up his heels and flung him into the arms of Charles Ivy May, one of his consorts, who that instant discharged him into the sea. And at the same time, Herodine compassed his business with the captain aforesaid. Cheeseman lost no time, but from the deck jumps into the hold and was about to beat out the brains of Archer, the quartermaster, having struck him two or three blows with his blunt weapon, the mallet, when Harry Giles, a young lad, came down after him, and desired his life might be spared as an evidence of their own innocence, that he, having all the spoil and plunder in his custody, it may appear that these tragic proceedings were not undertaken with any dishonest view of seizing or appropriating the effects to themselves, which prudent advice prevailed, and he and three more were made prisoners and secured. The work being done, they went about ship, altered the course from Newfoundland to Boston, and arrived safe the 3rd of May following, to the great joy of that province. On the 12th of May, 1724, a special court of admiralty was held for the trial of these pirates, when John Fillmore, Edward Cheeseman, John Combs, Henry Giles, Charles Ivy May, John Bootman, and Henry Payne, the seven that confederated together for the pirates' destruction, were honorably acquitted, as also three Frenchmen, John Baptiste, Peter Taffery, and Isaac Lassen, and three Negroes, Pedro, Francisco, and Piero, and John Rose Archer, the quartermaster, William White, William Taylor, and William Phillips, were condemned. The two latter were reprieved for a year and a day, in order to be recommended, though I don't know for what, as objects of His Majesty's mercy. The two former were executed on the 2nd of June, and died very penitently, making the following declarations at the place of execution, with the assistance of two grave divines that attended them. The dying declarations of John Rose Archer and William White, on the day of their execution at Boston, June 2nd, 1724, for the crimes of piracy. First, separately, of Archer. I greatly bewail my profanations of the Lord's day and my disobedience to my parents, and my cursing and swearing and my blaspheming the name of the glorious God, unto which I have added the sins of unchastity, and I have provoked the Holy One at length to leave me unto the crimes of piracy and robbery, wherein, at last, I have brought myself under the guilt of murder also." But one wickedness that has led me as much as any to all the rest has been my brutish drunkenness. By strong drink I have been heated and hardened into the crimes that are now more bitter than death unto me. I could wish that masters of vessels would not use their men with so much severity as many of them do, which exposes them to great temptations. And then of white. I am now with sorrow reaping the fruits of my disobedience to my parents, who used their endeavors to have me instructed in my Bible and my catechism, and the fruits of my neglecting the public worship of God and profaning the Holy Sabbath, 
and of my blaspheming the name of God, my Maker. But my drunkenness has had a great hand in bringing my ruin upon me. I was drunk when I was enticed aboard the pirate. And now, for all the vile things I did aboard, I own the justice of God and man in what is done unto me. Of both together, we hope, we truly hate the sins, whereof we have the burthen lying so heavy upon our consciences. We warn all people, and particularly young people, against such sins as these. We wish all may take warning by us. We beg for pardon, for the sake of Christ our Savior, and our hope is in Him alone. Oh, that in His blood our scarlet and crimson guilt may all be washed away. We are sensible of and hard heart in us, full of wickedness, and we look upon God for His renewing grace upon us. We bless God for the space of repentance which He has given us, and that He has not cut us off in the midst and height of our wickedness. We are not without hope that God has been savingly at work upon our souls. We are made sensible of our absolute need of the righteousness of Christ, that we may stand justified before God in that. We renounce all dependence on our own. We are humbly thankful to the ministers of Christ for the great pains they have taken for our good. The Lord reward their kindness. We don't despair of mercy, but hope through Christ that when we die, we shall find mercy with God and be received into his kingdom. We wish others, and especially the seafaring, may get good by what they see this day befalling of us. Declared in the presence of J.W.D.M. End of chapter 15. Recording by Catherine. Hong Kong. March 2010. Chapter 16 of The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barry Eads. The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1, by Charles Johnson. Chapter 16. Of Captain Spriggs and His Crew. Spriggs sailed with Lowe for a pretty while, and I believe came away from Lothar along with him. He was quartermaster to the company, and consequently had a great share in all the barbarities committed by that execrable gang till the time they parted, which was about Christmas last, when Lowe took a ship of twelve guns on the coast of Guinea, called the Delight, formerly the Squirrel, man of war, commanded by Captain Hunt. Spriggs took possession of the ship with eighteen men, left Lowe in the night, and came to the West Indies. This separation was occasioned by a quarrel with Lowe, concerning a piece of justice Spriggs would have executed upon one of the crew, for killing a man in cold blood, as they call it, one insisting that he should be hanged, and the other that he should not. A day or two after they parted, Spriggs was chose captain by the rest, and a black ensign was made, which they called Jolly Roger, with the same device that Captain Lowe carried viz. a white skeleton in the middle of it, with a dart in one hand striking a bleeding heart, and in the other an hourglass. When this was finished and hoisted, they fired all their guns to salute their captain and themselves, and then looked out for prey. In their voyage to the West Indies, these pirates took a Portuguese bark, wherein they got valuable plunder, but not contented with that alone, they said they would have a little game with the men, and so ordered them a sweat, more for the brute's diversion than the poor men's health, which operation is performed after this manner. They stick up lighted candles circularly round the mizzenmast, between decks, within which the patients one at a time enter. Without the candles, the pirates post themselves as many as can stand, forming another circle, and armed with pen-knives, tucks, forks, compasses, etc., and, as he runs round and round, the music playing at the same time, they prick him with these instruments. This usually lasts for ten or twelve minutes, which is as long as the miserable man can support himself. When the sweating was over, they gave the Portuguese their boat with a small quantity of provisions, and set their vessel on fire. Near the island of St. Lucia, 
they took a sloop belonging to Barbados, which they plundered and then burnt, forcing some of the men to sign their articles. The others they beat and cut in a barbarous manner, because they refused to take on with the crew, and then sent them away in the boat, who all got safe afterwards to Barbados. The next was a Martinico man, which they served as bad as they had done the others, but did not burn their ship. Some days afterwards, in running down to leeward, they took one Captain Hawkins, coming from Jamaica, loaden chiefly with logwood. They took out of her stores, arms, ammunition, and several other things, as they thought fit, and what they did not want they threw overboard or destroyed. They cut the cables to pieces, knocked down the cabins, broke all the windows, and in short took all the pains in the world to be mischievous. They took by force out of her Mr. Burridge and Mr. Stevens, the two mates, and some other hands, and after detaining the ship from the 22nd of March to the 29th, they let her go. On the 27th they took a Rhode Island sloop, Captain Pike, and all his men were obliged to go aboard the pirate, but the mate, being a grave, sober man, and not inclinable to stay, they told him he should have his discharge, and that it should be immediately writ on his back, whereupon he was sentenced to receive ten lashes from every man in the ship, which was rigorously put in execution. The next day Mr. Burridge, Captain Hawkins's mate, signed their articles, which was so agreeable to them, he being a good artist and sailor, that they gave three huzzas, fired all the guns in the ship, and appointed him master. The day was spent in boisterous mirth, roaring and drinking of health, among which was, by mistake, that of King George the Second. For you must know, now and then, the gentry are provoked to sudden fits of loyalty, by the expectation of an act of grace. It seems Captain Pike had heard at Jamaica that the king was dead, so the pirates immediately hoisted their ensign, half-mast, the death signal, and proclaimed his royal highness, saying, They doubted not but there would be a general pardon in a twelve-month, which they would embrace and come in upon, but damn them if they should be expected out of it, they would murder every Englishman that should fall into their hands. The second of April they spied a sail, and gave her chase till twelve o'clock at night. The pirates believed her to be a Spaniard. When they came close up to her, they discharged a broadside, with small and great shot, which was followed by another. But the ship, making a lamentable cry for quarters, they ceased firing and ordered the captain to come aboard, which he did. But how disappointed the rogues were when they found was their old friend Captain Hawkins, whom they had sent away three days before, worth not one penny. This was such a bulk to them, that they resolved he should suffer for falling in their way, though it was so contrary to his own inclinations. About fifteen of them surrounded the poor man with sharp cutlasses and fell upon him, whereupon he was soon laid flat on the deck. In that instant Burridge flew amongst the thickest of the villains and begged earnestly for his life, upon whose request was granted. They were now most of them drunk, as is usual at this time of night, so they unanimously agreed to make a bonfire of Hawkins's ship, which was immediately done, and in half an hour she was all of a blaze. After this they wanted a little more diversion, and so Captain Hawkins was sent for down to the cabin to supper. What should the provision be but a dish of candles, which he was forced to eat, having a naked sword and a pistol held to his breast all the while? When this was over they buffeted him about for some time, and sent him forward amongst the other prisoners, who had been treated with the same delicacies. Two days afterwards they anchored at a little uninhabited island called Rattan, near the bay of Honduras, and put ashore Captain Hawkins and several other men, one of them his passenger, who died there of the hardships he underwent. They gave them powder and ball and a musket, with which they were to shift as they could, sailing away the next day for other adventures. Captain Hawkins and his unfortunate companions stayed nineteen days upon this island, supplying themselves with both fish and fowl, such as they were, at which time came two men in a canoe that had been left upon another maroon island near Benica, who carried the company at several times thither, it being more convenient in having a good well of fresh water and plenty of fish, etc. Twelve days afterwards they spied a sloop off at sea, 
which, upon their making a great smoke, stood in and took them off. She was the Merriam, Captain Jones, lately escaped out of the Bay of Honduras from being taken by the Spaniards. At an island to the westward, the pirates cleaned their ship and sailed towards the island of St. Christopher's to wait for one Captain Moore, who commanded the Eagle Sloop when she took Lothers upon the Careen at Blanco. Spriggs resolved to put him to death, whenever he took him, for falling upon his friend and brother, but instead of more he found a Frenchman of war from Martinico upon the coast, which Spriggs, not thinking fit to contend with, run away with all the sail he could make. The Frenchman crowded after him, and was very likely speak to Mr. Briggs, when unfortunately his main top mast came by the board, which obliged him to give over the chase. Spriggs then stood to the northward, toward Bermuda's, or the Summer Isles, and took a schooner belonging to Boston. He took out all the men and sunk the vessel, and had the impudence to tell the master that he designed to increase his company on the banks of Newfoundland, and then would sail for the coast of New England in quest of Captain Solgard, who attacked and took their consort Charles Harris, Spriggs being then in low sloop, who very fairly ran for it. The pirate asked the master if he knew Captain Solgard, who answering no, he asked another the same question, and then a third, who said he knew him very well, upon which Spriggs ordered him to be sweated, which was done in the manner before described. Instead of going to Newfoundland as the pirates threatened, they came back to the islands, and to windward of St. Christopher's, on the 4th of June last, took a sloop, Nicholas Trot, master, belonging to St. Estusha, and wanting a little diversion, they hoisted the men as high as the main and four tops, and let them run down a main, enough to break all the bones in their skins, and after they had pretty well crippled them by this cruel usage, and whipped them about the deck, they gave Trot his sloop and let him go, keeping back only two of his men, besides the plunder of the vessel. Within two or three days they took a ship coming from Rhode Island to St. Christopher's, loaden with provisions and some horses. The pirates mounted the horses and rid them about the deck backwards and forwards a full gallop, like madmen at New Market, cursing, swearing, and hollowing, at such a rate that made the poor creatures wild, and at length, two or three of them throwing their riders, they fell upon the ship's crew, and whipped and cut and beat them in a barbarous manner, telling them it was for bringing horses without boots and spurs, for want of which they were not able to ride them. This is the last account we have had of Captain Spriggs. I shall only add the two following relations and conclude. A brigantine belonging to Bristol, one Mr. Rowry, master, had been trading at Gambia in Africa, and falling as low as Cape Mount to finish the slaving of the vessel, he had, by a misfortune usual at that part of the coast, his mate, surgeon, and two more of his men, panniered, footnote, term for stealing of men used all over the coast, end footnote, by the Negroes. The remainder of his company, which was not above five or six in number, took this opportunity and seized the vessel in the road, making the master prisoner. You will think it prodigious imprudent that so small a number should undertake to proceed a pirating, especially when neither of them had sufficient skill in navigation. Yet this they did, leaving those people, their shipmates above mentioned, to the mercy of the barbarous natives, and sailed away down the coast, making them a black flag, which they merrily said would be as good as fifty men more, i.e. would carry as much terror, and that they did not doubt of soon increasing their crew, to put them in an enterprising capacity, but their vain projection was soon happily frustrated, and after this manner. The master, whose life they had preserved, perhaps only for supplying their own unskillfulness in navigation, advised them that since contrary to their expectations they had met with no ship between Cape Mount and the Bight of Calabar to proceed to the island of St. Thomas's, where they might recruit with provisions and water and sell off the slaves, about seventy of them, which they perceived would be a useless lumber and incommodious to their design. They arrived there in August 1721, and one evening, while part of them were on shore, applying for this purpose to the governor, and the other part carelessly from the deck, Mr. Rowry stepped into the boat belonging to the vessel and pushed off very suddenly. 
They heard the noise it made, and soon were upon deck again, but having no other boat to pursue, nor a musket ready to fire, he got safe on shore, and ran to the governor with his complaint, who immediately imprisoned those already there, and sent a launch off to take the rest out of the ship. The Swallow arrived at St. Thomas's the beginning of October following, where, on Mr. Rowry's remonstrance, application was made to the Portuguese governor of that island for a surrendery of these five English prisoners then in the castle, but he not only preemptorily excused himself from it, as a matter out of his power, without particular direction from the court of Portugal, but withal insinuated that they had only taken refuge there from the hardships and severity they had met with from their master. The manner of denial, and the avaricious temper of the gentleman, which I had occasion to be acquainted with, makes it very suspicious that he proposed considerable gains to himself, for if Mr. Rowry had not made such an escape to him, the slaves had been his for little or nothing, as a bribe to silence his suspicions, which any man, less acute than he, must have had from the awkward and unskillful carriage of such merchants. But enough of this. Perhaps he is not the only governor abroad that finds an interest in countenancing these fellows. End of chapter 16 An account of the piracies and murders committed by Philip Roach, etc., of the General History of the Pirates, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barry Eads. The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1, by Charles Johnson. An account of the piracies and murders committed by Philip Roach, etc., Philip Roach was born in Ireland, and from his youth had been bred up to the sea. He was a brisk, genteel fellow, of thirty years of age at the time of his death, one whose black and savage nature did no ways answer the comeliness of his person, his life being almost one continued scene of villainy, before he was discovered to have committed the horrid murders we are now speaking of. This inhumane monster had been concerned with others, in insuring ships to a great value and then destroying them, by which means and other rogueries he had got a little money, and being mate of a ship was diligent enough in trading for himself between Ireland and France, so that he was in a way of getting himself a comfortable livelihood. But as he resolved to be rich, and finding fair dealing brought in wealth but slowly, he contrived to put other things in execution, and certainly had murdered several innocent persons in the prosecution of his abominable schemes. But as I have now forgot the particular circumstances of those relations, I shall confine myself at present to the fact for which he suffered. Roach, getting acquainted with one Neil, a fisherman at Cork, whom he found ready for any villainous attempt, he imparted his design to him, who, being pleased with the project, brings one Pierce Cullen and his brother into the Confederacy, together with one Wise, who at first was very unwilling to come into their measures, and indeed had the least hand in the perpetration of what follows. They pitched upon a vessel in the harbor, belonging to Peter Tortu, a Frenchman, to execute their cruel intentions upon, because it was a small one, and had not a great number of hands on board, and t'was easy afterwards to exchange it for one more fit for piracy, and therefore they applied themselves to the master of her for a passage to Nance, whereto the ship was bound, and accordingly, the beginning of November 1721, they went aboard, and when at sea, Philip Roach, being an experienced sailor, the master of the vessel readily trusted him with the care of her at times, while he and the mate went to rest. The 15th of November, at night, was the time designed for the tragedy, but Francis Wise relented, and appeared desirous to divert them from their bloody purposes. Roach, sometimes called Captain, told him, that as Cullen and he had sustained great losses at sea, unless every Irish man present would assist in repairing their losses, by murdering all the French rogues, and running away with the ship, he should suffer the same fate with the Frenchmen but if all would assist, all should have a share in the booty. 
Upon this they all resolved alike, and Captain Roach ordered three Frenchmen and a boy up to hand the topsails, the master and mate being then asleep in their cabins. The two first that came down, they beat out their brains and threw them overboard. The other two, seeing what was done, ran up to the topmost head, but Cullen followed them, and taking the boy by the arm, tossed him into the sea. Then driving down the man, those below knocked him on the head and threw him overboard. Those who were asleep, being awakened by the dismal shrieks and groans of dying men, ran upon deck in confusion to inquire into the cause of such unusual noises. But the same cruelty was immediately acted towards them, ere they could be sensible of the danger that threatened them. They were now, as Roach himself afterwards confessed, all over as wet with the blood that had been spilt as if they had been dipped in water, or stood in a shower of rain, nor did they regard it any more, Roach said. Captain Tortu used many words for mercy, and asked them if he had not used them with civility and kindness, if they were not the same Christian religion, and owned the same blessed Jesus, and the like. But they, not regarding what he said, took cords and bound the poor master and his mate back to back, and while that was doing, both of them begged with the utmost earnestness, and used the most solemn entreaties, that they would at least allow them a few minutes to say their prayers, and beg mercy of God for the various sins and offenses of their lives. But it did not move them, though all the rest were dead, and no danger could be apprehended from them two alone, for the bound persons were hurried up and thrown into the sea. The massacre being finished, they washed themselves a little from the blood, and searched the chests and lockers, and all places about the ship and then sat down in the captain's cabin, and refreshed themselves with some rum they found there, and, as Roach confessed, were never merrier in their lives. They invested Roach with the command of the ship, and calling him captain, talked over their liquor, what rare actions they would perform about Cape Britain, Sable Isle, and the banks of Newfoundland, whither they designed to go as soon as they had recruited their company, and got a better ship, which they proposed speedily to do. Roach, taking upon himself the command of the vessel, Andrew Cullen was to pass for a merchant or supercargo, but when they bethought themselves that they were in danger of being discovered by the papers of the ship relating to the cargo as bills of lading, etc., therefore they erase and take out the name of the French master, and instead thereof inserted the name of Roach, so that it stood in the ship's papers. Peter Roach Master that then having so few hands on board, they contrived, if they met any ships, to give out that they had lost some hands by their being washed overboard in a storm, and by that means screened themselves from being suspected of having committed some such wicked act, by reason of the fewness of their hands on board, and also might prevail with some ship to spare them some, on consideration of their pretended disaster. In going to Calais they were in distress by the weather, and being near Lisbon they made complaint to a ship, but obtained no assistance. They were then obliged to sail back for England, and put into the port of Dartmouth, but then they were in fear lest they might be discovered, therefore to prevent that they resolved to alter the ship, and getting workmen they take down the mizzenmast and build a spar deck, and made rails, on pretense that the sailors had been washed overboard, to secure the men. Then they took down the image of St. Peter at the head of the ship, and put up a lion in its place, and painted over the stern of the ship with red, and new named her the Mary Snow. The ship being thus altered that they thought it could not be known, they fancied themselves pretty secure, but wanting money to defray the charge of these alterations, Roach, as master of the vessel, and Andrew Cullen, as merchant, apply themselves to the officers of the customs for liberty to dispose of some of the cargo, in order to pay the workmen, which they having obtained, they sold fifty-eight barrels of beef, and having hired three more hands, they set sail for Ostend, and there having sold more barrels of beef, they steer their course to Rotterdam, dispose of the rest of the cargo, and took in one Mr. Annesley, who freighted the ship for England, but in their passage, in a stormy night, it being very dark, they took up Mr. Annesley, their passenger, and threw him into the sea, who swam about the ship a pretty while, calling out for life, and telling them they should have all his goods, if they would receive him again into the vessel. 
but in vain were his cries. After this they were obliged to put into several ports, and by contrary winds came to the coast of France, and hearing there was an inquiry made after the ship, Roach quits her at Havre de Grace, and leaves the management to Cullen and the rest, who, having shipped other men, sailed away to Scotland, and there quitted the vessel, which was afterwards seized and brought into the river of Thames. Some time after this, Philip Roach came to London, and making some claim for money he had made insurance of, in the name of John Eustace, the officer was apprised of the fraud, and he arrested and flung into the compter, from whence directing a letter to his wife, she showed it to a friend, who discovered by it that he was the principal villain concerned in the destruction of Peter Tortu and the crew. Upon this an information was given to my lord Carteret that the person who went by the name of John Eustace was Philip Roach, as aforesaid, and being brought down by his lordship's warrant, he stiffly denied it for some time, notwithstanding a letter was found in his pocket, directed to him by the name of Roach, but being confronted by a captain of a ship who knew him well, he confessed it, but prevaricated in several particulars, whereupon he was committed to Newgate upon violent suspicion, and the next day was brought down again at his own request, confessed the whole, desired to be made in evidence, and promised to convict three men worse than himself. Two were discovered by him, who died miserably in the martial sea, and Roach himself was afterwards tried, no more being taken, found guilty of the piracy, and executed. End of An Account of the Piracies and Murders Committed by Philip Roach, etc. An Abstract of the Civil Law and Statute Law Now in Force in Relation to Piracy Of the General History of the Pirates, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barry Eads the General History of the Pirates, Volume 1, by Charles Johnson. An Abstract of the Civil Law and the Statute Law Now in Force in Relation to Piracy. A pirate is hostis humanus generis, a common enemy, with whom neither faith nor oath is to be kept, according to Tully. And by the laws of nature, princes and states are responsible for their neglect if they do not provide remedies for restraining these sorts of robberies. Though pirates are called common enemies, yet they are properly not to be termed so. He is only to be honored with that name, says Cicero, who hath a commonwealth, a court, a treasury, consent and concord of citizens, and some way, if occasion be, of peace and league. But when they have reduced themselves into a government or state, as those of Algier, Sally, Tripoli, Tunis, and the like, they then are allowed the solemnities of war and the rights of legation. If letters of marquee be granted to a merchant, and he furnishes out a ship with a captain and mariners, and they, instead of taking the goods or ships of that nation against whom their commission is awarded, take the ship and goods of a friend, this is piracy. And if the ship arrive in any part of his majesty's dominions, it will be seized and forever lost to the owners but they are no way liable to make satisfaction. If a ship is assaulted and taken by the pirates, for redemption of which the master becomes a slave to the captors, by the law marine the ship and lading are tacitly obliged for his redemption by a general contribution, but if it happen through his own folly, then no contribution is to be made. If subjects in enmity with the crown of England are aboard an English pirate, in company with English, and a robbery is committed, and they are taken, it is felony in the English, but not in the stranger, for it was no piracy in them, but the depredation of an enemy, and they will be tried by a martial law. If piracy is committed by subjects in enmity with England upon the British seas, it is properly only punishable by the crown of England, who have istud regimen and dominion exclusive of all other power. If piracy be committed on the ocean, and the pirates in the attempt be overcome, the captors may, without any solemnity of condemnation, hang them up at the mainyard. If they are brought to the next port, and the judge rejects the trial, 
or the captors cannot wait for the judge, without peril or loss, justice may be done upon them by the captors. If merchandise be delivered to a master to carry to one port, and he carries it to another, and sells and disposes of it, this is not felony. But if, after unlading it at the first port, he retakes it, it is piracy. If a pirate attack a ship, and the master for redemption gives his oath to pay a sum of money, though there be nothing taken, yet it is piracy by the law marine. If a ship is riding in anchor, and the mariners all ashore, and a pirate attack her and rob her, this is piracy. If a man commit piracy upon the subjects of any prince or republic, though an enmity with us, and brings the goods into England, and sells them in a market overt, the same shall bind, and the owners are for ever excluded. If a pirate enters a port of this kingdom, and robs a ship at anchor there, it is not piracy, because not done, super altum mare, but is robbery at common law, because infra corpus comitatus. A pardon of all felonies does not extend to piracy, but the same ought to be especially named. By 28 H. 8. Murthers and robberies committed upon the sea, or in other places, where the admiral pretends jurisdiction, shall be inquired into, tried, heard, and determined in such places and counties within the realm, as shall be limited by the king's commission, in like manner as if such offences were done at land. And such commissions, being under the great seal, shall be directed to the lord admiral, his lieutenant or deputy, and to three or four such others as the Lord Chancellor shall name. The said commissioners, or three of them, have power to inquire of such offences by twelve lawful men of the country, so limited in their commission, as if such offences were done at land, within the same county, and every indictment so found and presented shall be good in law, and such order, progress, judgment, and execution shall be used, had, done, and made thereupon, as against offenders for murder and felony done at land. Also, the trial of such offenses, if they be denied, shall be had by twelve men of the country, limited in the said commission, as aforesaid, and no challenge shall be had for the hundred, and such as shall be convict of such offenses, shall suffer death without benefit of clergy, and forfeit land and goods, as in case of felonies and murders done at land. This act shall not prejudice any person or persons urged by necessity for taking victuals, cables, ropes, anchors, or sails out of another ship that may spare them, so as they either pay ready money or money worth for them, or give a bill for the payment thereof, if on this side the Straits of Gibraltar, within four months, if beyond, within twelve months." When any such commission shall be sent to any place within the jurisdiction of the Sinki ports, it shall be directed to the warden of the said ports, or his deputy with three or four other persons, as the Lord Chancellor shall name, and the inquisition or trial of such offenses there shall be made and had by the inhabitants of the said ports and members of the same. By 11 and 12 W, 3 C, 7. If any natural-born subjects or denizens of England commit piracy or any act of hostility against His Majesty's subjects at sea, under color of a commission or authority from any foreign prince or state or person whatsoever, such offenders shall be adjudged pirates. If any commander or master of a ship or seaman or mariner give up his ship, etc., to pirates, or combine to yield up or run away with any ship, or lay violent hand on his commander, or endeavor to make a revolt in the ship, he shall be adjudged a pirate. All persons who after the twenty ninth of September, 1720, shall set forth any pirate, or be aiding or assisting to any such pirate, committing piracy on land or sea, or shall conceal such pirates, or receive any vessel or goods pirately taken, shall be adjudged accessory to such piracy, and suffer as principals. By 4 G. C. 11, Section 7, all persons who have committed or shall commit any offenses for which they ought to be adjudged pirates, by the Act 11 and 12, W. 3 C. 7, may be tried for every such offense, 
in such manner as by the Act 28H 8C 15 is directed for the trial of pirates, and shall not have the benefit of clergy. Section 8. This Act shall not extend to persons convicted or attainted in Scotland. Section 9. This Act shall extend to His Majesty's dominions in America, and be taken as a public act. Finesse. End of An Abstract of the Civil Law and Statute Law Now in Force in Relation to Piracy End of The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1, by Charles Johnson